What we want to do today is actually shift your attention. We're going to start thinking about, it's really sort of the tail end of what we're going to be doing in this class, and that's thinking about with all these models having been created, how we can now use them really as clients of the models, how we can use them to go through and get answers to questions we want. Answers about what should the size of the structural members be, or how much is that going to cost, or how much energy is this building going to use? Where, given that you do have a model, can we use the geometry that's been specified in the model to help us sort of get answers to all those questions by looking at them in different types of analysis software? So today we're going to talk about how we can take our model and actually export the data in the model to eTabs. So uh, one of the structural analysis packages that's commonly used, very commonly used here because we have it installed and used in the structures, uh, steel classes, and a lot of folks on the structure side are using it for their classes. But eTabs is sort of one very commonly used piece of software. But what we're going to do today would work just as well with RISA or Robot Structure, or there's a number of different sort of structural packages that, uh, that BIM models can interact with. So we're going to look at the structural side today. We're also going to be looking at the energy side again today, sort of taking it from the standpoint that we've already have a model that's a little bit developed, how we can take that into some energy analysis software to understand really how much energy is flowing in and out of the building and really what would the impact be of changing the wall assemblies or changing the roof or the glazing to a different uh, R value and really what, how big an impact would that have on you know, the energy use. Because really what we're going to want to do ultimately is be able to start answering questions like, well, if, if we do want to go through and change and have a more energy efficient building, how much can we save by putting in that better R value or that better glazing? But then also, how much is it going to cost? So we can start being smart about making the trade off between those two different things. Because for all these different improvements, there's always a cost. And it's not clear that it's always worthwhile to put them in. In fact, when we, oh, one of the analysis we can look at, it has to do with photovoltaic potential. Yeah, it's, and you'll find that very quickly, it's not worthwhile to put solar panels all over the side of everything because there's an awful lot of locations where they're just not really achieving the efficiency in terms of what they're actually generating that they'll ever pay for themselves. So it's almost always better to try reducing the energy loads before you ever get to the point of trying to do this like uh, alternative energy generation. But we're going to start with structural analysis, then we'll move into energy, and then on Thursday we're going to start moving into cost and stuff like that. So here's where we're going. In terms of structural analysis, we're going to be able to take a Revit architecture, a structure model, model the structural framing elements, kind of like what you've been doing in, set in uh, assignment three. But we're going to add a few things to it. We're going to add some boundary conditions and some loads to the model, something that we haven't added so far, and then take it over to some analysis software where we can analyze the members and try to do some sizing of the members based on what it's doing. Now, in terms of what we're doing, I'm not real strong in terms of using eTabs, so I'm going to depend on you guys who are a little stronger on using eTabs to help guide me through that piece. But we'll get the model into eTabs, do a basic analysis, and you know, look to you to give us a little guidance about what sort of members should be changed based on what we're seeing in eTabs. We'll change those things and then basically bring the model back over to Revit. That's kind of the workflow. And the idea is we can do a little bit of iteration so that we can have a Revit model, take it over and do some analysis, make any changes that are necessary based on the analysis, and then kind of keep on iterating without losing data along the way. So that's the vision of where we're going here. So to get there, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to start by just modeling a real basic little structural frame by creating a grid system. I'm going to go through and put some columns on it, put some beams on it, and just make a little like two bay frame. Always in the spirit of let's learn how to like walk before we try to run with this, but just see if we can sort of control the basic flow of information and see if this works. So it's going to start, I'm going to put this grid system together, put some columns down on it, and then put some beams, very much like what you've been doing so far. Okay? So let me go over to Revit structure, and we will do that. I'll say create a new structure. And for anyone who wants to follow along, if you fall off somewhere along the way, I'll keep on saving models out to the L drive as we go so that you can kind of pick back up again if uh, you sort of fall off somewhere and you want to keep going. But we'll go to the Home tab. And again, I'm going to start by just putting some grids. I'm going to put some columns down and put some beams connecting them. So let's grab the grids. And I'm just going to put a single grid coming across this way. That'll be like line one. And I'll put some other grids in the opposite direction. So I'll just sort of say, oh, right about here. And I'll call that grid A. 
Then I'm going to put some other grids in here. I'll just put a B and a C, about 30, oh, maybe 25 feet, somewhere in there. There's B and C. Okay, so that's not too bad so far. Just some grids that are really just a place for us to work. Now, especially when we're doing the structural analysis, it's nice to have the grids so we can reference that as column A1 and that as column C1, just so we have some real uh, like coordinates to work with. Now, for placing the columns, I mean, most of you have been playing around with this. I'll place a structural column. And I can do it in a couple different ways. Some of the things to watch out for is, are we going deep or are we going above? And this is that whole thing about Revit. Structure likes to think about going down. In Revit architecture, we like to think about things going up. It's just the, it's the way structural engineers versus architects look at the world. They look at it differently. Architects tend to think about what's above the floor. Structural engineers often think about what's supporting the floor. So I'm going to change this to be, I'm on level, actually I'm on level two right now. Let me go to level one. I could have done it the other way. Go to level two and drop it down. But I'll go to level one. I'm going to say bring it up to height up to level two. Doesn't really matter. I could even change that after the fact. It's really just I want level one to level two in the end of this. And I'll say, let's go ahead and put these on the grids. So I'll choose on grids. And I can choose that grid. And I'll control click to get that grid. And notice when I select the grids, it even puts in there little placeholders, little suggestions of if you say OK right now, this is where I'm going to put the columns. So it did that just based on the fact that those are the intersections. I'll say finish that up. Can now, with any luck, we have some columns hanging around out there. Now on these columns, let's kind of move on in there. You might notice there's actually a couple different lines you'll want to pay attention to. There's the 3D geometry. Okay, that's kind of hanging around here. There's also this little blue line. That's called the analytical model line. And really, in the scheme of things, for the analysis standpoint, that's the important line. That's where it thinks the column is. We can sort of shift around the physical location a little bit, offset things to lower them, raise them up, move them around. But ultimately, that blue line is what's considered to be the end of, or the actual location, the center line of that, from the analysis standpoint. And this hits you more when you're putting beams in there, where sometimes if we offset the beams, the orange line stays up, but the uh, beam actually drops down a little bit. And it's just from an analytical standpoint, we tend to think about the beam being right at level two, even though when we build it, we often lower the beam so it's below the floor depth. But let me show you what that is in terms of the beam. That'll make more sense if I actually show you. I'll put a beam in here. I often put beams in in 3D, just because it's a little bit easier for me to kind of grab them that way. I'll put it at level two. I'll say 3D snapping, and I'll just choose the top of that one and bring it over to the top of that one. Okay, so here we are. Here's that issue of the analytical line versus the beam right now. Now, what a lot of people have done, and it's kind of nice form, is if you can take the beams, and if you think that they actually won't be at level two, they'll actually be down a little bit below the floor deck. You can change the properties of the beam. A couple ways we could do that. There's this start and end level offset. Those are um, adjustable independently. So if you have a sloping beam, you can kind of do whatever you want in terms of raising one or lowering one and doing that. Another way to do it, though, is if you want the whole thing just to go up or down evenly, is this thing called the Z direction justification. Currently, the beam is up at the top, so it's at the top where that line is. If you set that to other, you can actually just kind of put a horizontal drop on the whole beam. So this is really sort of equivalent. I could do this by changing the ends of both, or I can put it right in here and drop it down either way. So again, don't worry if you've done it one way and not the other. As long as it's sort of in there one way or the other, you're OK. But so now the beam is actually dropped down a little bit below the analytical line. Okay, And again, that's more a construction detail than an analysis detail. When we analyze it, we analyze it like the beams at level two. It's just from the constructability and the, the detailing standpoint, it's better to drop it down so that the beam doesn't look like it's conflicting with the, uh, the deck. OK. But let me, I'll just undo that, keep it up, make it simple for now. OK. So I've got some beams. I've got some column. Let me go ahead and put another beam in there. I'll put beam in here, and I'll again 3D snap it. And I'll put it from this one over to that one. 
And then I can go through and put some foundations under this thing too. Okay, for the foundations, I'll go ahead and grab the uh, little um, isolated footing. Now, this has some kind of cool tools in it too. We can go ahead and kind of place them very oh, precisely, but a nice kind of shortcut is this at columns tool. At columns will say, you know, if I put them in at level one and just choose the column, It'll just put them, oops, I have to kind of control click to get them all. Okay, and you can put them in like that. So that's just uh, another little shortcut. Revit is full of shortcuts, and as you keep on working with it, you sort of pick these up and just get to be a little bit quicker about the whole thing. There's no difference. You could have gone to level one and placed it very precisely, but there's always these little kind of tricks for like making it a little bit quicker. Yeah, sure. That went, that was a good one. It went by too fast, huh? Okay, so. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the isolated uh, footing again. If you haven't done this yet, note it for tonight. <laughs> say at columns, and it'll say at what level. I'll put it at level one. Okay. I'm in sort of this special mode right now where I'm placing these things, and I can just choose the different ones, and it say finish the selection. So I'm going to choose one, and it sort of ghosts it in there. Then I'm going to control click to sort of suggest, oh, how about this one too? And how about that one too? And if you like those as potential locations, then you can just say finish. And it will finally put them in. Does that kind of look about right? Excellent. No worries. OK, so this part, so far, this should look an awful lot like what you did for assignment three. It's pretty similar in terms of themes, columns. You have some more stuff going on, but that's sort of the basis of it right there. Now, up to this point, there's nothing that I've done so far that I couldn't have done in Revit architecture. Revit structure and Revit architecture at this level are the same. You can put those elements in, in both of them because you know it's, it's really the same thing. Those types of elements are available in both of the platforms. Now we're going to start, though, going a little bit into sort of what structure is uniquely good at. And that is, if I can get this right actually starting to put loads and boundary conditions on this. Because so far, our 3D model, it's kind of hanging around there in XYZ space. It's nice. It seems to be sitting on the ground, but we haven't really anchored it anyway. We haven't really put any boundary conditions. So if I just put a bunch of loads on it right now and said run an analysis, like it could just start dropping in space because it's really, you know, it seems to be at the ground level, but there's nothing anchoring it. So from an analytical standpoint, we'd like to say that, you know, that at the bottom of those columns where those footings are, stop moving there. That should actually be a boundary condition. We don't want things to move beyond that. And that'll create some resistance. It'll ultimately give us a reaction and kind of like uh, start pushing back. So we're going to put some boundary conditions on the bottoms of the columns, just so the bottoms don't push down into the ground. We need to sort of stop the movement somehow. And then we're going to go through and put some loads on the beams. Okay? And this is the stuff where now you had to move out of architecture and move into structure. So let's take a look at that. For the boundaries, there's really three types of boundaries we can choose. We can choose point boundaries, which is when we have like a point load coming down from a column. We sort of put a point boundary there. Okay. We have a line boundary. If you have an entire wall that's bearing, you can put like, oh, like a linear footing, a strip footing. That would be a line boundary. An area boundary would be something you put under an entire area. So if you have a big floor slab or something like that, that would be an area boundary because you want the whole floor slab to resist. Okay, so, and for these things, we get to sort of choose, is it a fixed connection, is it a pin connection, or is it a roller connection? And this has to do with how many degrees of freedom there are at that point. So let's go ahead and uh, let's put some in, and we'll sort of talk about that. So here I am. I am looking at the bottom of the column there. Let me go and just wireframe it. What I'm going to do is switch over to the Analyze tab and choose Boundary Conditions. You see under this, we have the loads, we have load combinations, we have this thing about checking to make sure things are supported. Let's go ahead and put some Boundary Conditions in. And I'm going to put some Point Conditions in. I'm going to just go right to that point right there. And I can choose whether it's fixed, pinned, roller, or some other condition where I choose which freedom degrees of freedom I want. You know, motion in the XYZ and rotation in the XYZ. You can sort of control all six. I'm going to make them fixed for now just to make it simple. 
Okay, and let me zoom on out. I'm going to put a fixed connection under each of these. Now, back in the old days, we used to be very concerned about whether structures were determinant or indeterminant and how we would go through and analyze all this stuff. With all the finite element stuff, it's actually pretty forgiving in terms of trying to figure out what's going to happen here. So, yeah, fixed is actually going to be okay for what we're doing right now. But as a structural engineer, if you know better, go ahead and kind of make those conditions a little more custom to what you want. But I'm just going to make them fixed because that's going to keep my life simple for right now. Only in structure. Okay, so it's one of the few things where things changed over. It's okay, we had that thing about the boundary conditions. Okay, another sort of thing that we have available that we have to sort of think about relative to our model is really for all these different connections, what is the nature of those connections? Are those a bunch of pinned connections? Is that a moment transferring connection? We have to sort of actually s indicate just really what that is. Is it a bolted sort of thing that'll slide? Is it a welded thing that's going to have some moment resistance? And we have these choices. Let me kind of go back over and talk about them. What properties you actually have depends on which material you're working with. So if you have a steel structure, you'll get the whole issue about is it a moment frame and really what the end releases are. Do we want it to release in all three directions or only in some of the different directions? If it's a concrete structure, it's a little bit different. The choices are sort of dependent on what the material is. Okay, so for a steel frame, let's just kind of take a look at what we can look at. If we come on over and we look at, for example, this beam, we have the issue <laughs> as it connects to that column. It's the question. There's all the geometry and the material that it's made out of. Now we have this whole issue down here. Really, what are those end connections? Is it a fixed connection? Is it a pin connection? Is it a bending moment connection? Or is it something that's user defined? Now, user defined gives you the choice where you can go ahead and choose what you want to release versus what you want to pin. If you check it off, it's released. Okay? So if we can choose whichever different sort of degrees of freedom we want to release, you can turn it that way. But if you change it to something like a fixed connection, you'll see that basically nothing's released. Okay, so that's like really fixed. It's X, Y, Z, and rotation. Yeah. So any sort of torquing that's going on, it's going to transfer to the column. Okay. Whereas if you go to like a pinned connection, you'll see that what's going on. It's not moving in X, Y, Z. Yeah, but it is released in terms of rotation in Y and Z. Okay, so it will transfer moment. Oh no, it won't transfer. It will release, so it won't transfer moment around. And okay, so the ex we talked about this in the last class in terms of that. So it's released in Y and Z, but it's okay. It's not in X. Let me think about this. I think the way they explain this to me is that if it's this way, I can't twist but I can bend like that, okay? But I can't do this, okay? But this is actually okay. But I gotta always think, you know, this stuff always like makes me think really hard about so the geometry and stuff like that, uh, about X, Y, and Z. Okay, but for now, let's go ahead and just leave those as pin connections. The net result of leaving them as a pin connection is that if we think about this frame, This is going to be a simply connected beam. So when we go through and connect it, it's going to deflect more like that. It's just going to have a little pin connection at the ends, and it'll kind of like freely deform like that. The difference would be if this were a moment frame or if these were fixed connections, as we tried to deflect down here, since it would transfer the moment, like these would actually start deflecting too. The columns would start deflecting because it would try to maintain that 90 degrees right in there. And you'd have a different sort of uh, connection where right over here we'd have moment transferring across there, and the columns would start torquing, but it would have to start actually help start reducing uh, resisting the loads. Okay, and depending upon which structural behavior you want, you can go ahead and change that. Now, this is actually with a case where let me see if I can come in there. There's moment connections. Yeah, if you do want to go through and create something like I talked about here, have a moment frame as opposed to just having uh, kind of simply connected things. You can go through and say that this connection is part of a moment frame system, and then it'll lock it in place and like uh, analyze it appropriately. So 
if you're into that kind of design, you can go there. No, 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 no. Let's check it out. It looks about the same in here. I'm betting, though, when we take it over to ETAP, what's going to happen, it'll have a different sort of symbol that somehow indicates the lock over on that side. Yes? Oh, good question. Yeah, um, that's a very good question in terms of where's start, where's one, and where's two. And that I am very bad at in terms of what's kind of, well, actually, no. Let's hang on. Let's just go through, let's try something different and see if we can make any sense out of it. So start, release, and release. Let's say that one's fixed. See if we can sort of see anything in there, because the question is really where's one and where's two at this point. Let me try visibility and graphics and see if we can sort of say anything in terms of what's happening in here, because I think of that as being, let's see, structural framing, beam system, structural connections, we're showing them. Don't know offhand. That's what I'm going to take a buy on for right now. I'll get, come up with the answer for you about how that visually represents itself, because yeah, it is, yeah, encoding that difference, so there ought to be some way to represent it visually so you can just spot it real quickly. And I just don't know what it is right offhand. I think it's a view property. Let's see if we can find anything in here. And that didn't change it very much. No. Let me kind of figure that one out for you. Because there, there, there's got to be a good answer to that, yeah. Whether it shows it as a different line or puts something funny at the corners. OK, so we got sort of the idea of the connections and how they're coming together. Let me go through and actually for these columns, change them at the bottom. I'm going to say that for these columns that it's actually going to be down at the column base. I'm going to make that fixed. Since I don't have any bracing in here, I don't want them to all be pinned. Then they would just sort of flop over. OK. Let me go ahead and save this one away. So if anyone wants to catch up, we can do that. Let me do a save. And I will put it out on the L drive on session 17. And I'll just say, well, structurally class. Yes? That I'm kind of gonna figure out what the di distinction is. That yeah, good question in terms of that thing because I think you know it. You know they should have a separate distinction, but I don't know what it is right offhand. Yeah, you, you, yeah, it, it doesn't seem like they're redundant with each other. There should be something like uh, some distinction in there. Okay, actually, what we should do is just try it both ways, then take it over to eTabs and sort of see what the difference is on that side in terms of what it comes through with. Okay, if you want to uh, kind of follow along on the L drive structure class to. Let me call it uh, step one complete. And I'll say that this is the uh, beams in. OK, so if you want to grab this so far, go ahead and feel free to grab that. Kay. After we've gone through and sort of just specified a little bit about the geometry, the next thing we want to do is just specify what the loading is. Okay, And how we do that is as follows. There's these loads, and we can put loads in here. If you choose the loading tool, you have the choice of point loads, line loads, or area loads. We can sort of put them at specific heights, or we can host them on elements. If you put them at heights, then they'll be at like level one or level two, regardless of where the beam is. If you host it on a beam or on a floor slab, then it'll move with the floor slab or the beam if the boom beam moves up or down with it. So if you put, for example, a point load on there and drop it on the beam, each of these different loads we put in there has a magnitude to it. So we can say instance properties. And if you say the instance properties, you'll see that this load belongs to one of our load cases and has a magnitude. So let's talk about the magnitude first. The magnitude is in kips, so thousands of pounds, kilopounds. Okay, so minus one is just basically a thousand pounds pointing straight down. If you want to change that, it's an instance property. So I could say that there's a point load here of minus 0.2, which would be 200 pounds just at that location. You'll see that actually the magnitude of the little vector changes too. 
Now these loads are sort of classified as either being live loads or dead loads. So let's talk about that. In fact, they can be belonging to a whole bunch of different load cases. Dead loads, live loads, wind loads, snow loads, seismic loads, temporary loads. You have all these different types of loads. And if you're in structural analysis and you're used to the whole idea of putting together different load cases, you know, you can assign each of the different loads to the specific case and then do the appropriate combinations to sort of get all the right different things that you need to check, the different sort of, you know, groupings that sort of make sense. Yes? You know what, um, according to work team or project, so these are not local? <laughs> Let's sort of see if we can figure it out. That I'm not sure what the case is. We should just look that up in the help. I don't know what the distinction of that one is. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. I don't really know what that one is. What's now work plane is actually that whole thing of uh, orient to work plane is like right now we're our, if our work plane, let me just turn that on so you can sort of see. Our our work plane is level two, and if we turn it on. So when we say orient to work plane, it's basically it's making it perpendicular to that plane. So it's calling the view perpendicular to whatever it says. Exactly. To so so if we change the work plane to be a vertical plane, we sh and we apply the load to it, then it should be perpendicular. It should be pointing horizontally instead. Okay. Now what project is, I'm not really sure. If that sort of gives us something. Uh, well, that's interesting. Project might get back to what it's considered, you know, I think of as the project zero ground plane, so it's always vertically, whereas this would give you the option of basically rotating it at some sort of angle. So you can imagine some sort of structure where we have these work planes going at funny obtuse angles and we want to apply loans perpendicular to the surface, but we want to go ahead and uh, just use the planes to define what that, perp that perpendicular direction should be. Okay, so you got different loads. Let me go ahead and also take a look at the loads and show you that under instance properties we can change it. For example, from a dead load to a live load. Okay, and when we do that, it'll actually change its color. So there's different colors representing the different loads. And what you tend to do is go through and build different what they'll call load cases, which are different combinations of loads that use different proportional relationships between the loads. So let's even kind of show you what that would look like. So for example, under analyze, there's this whole issue of load cases. This is this whole notion of you know, live load, dead load. You know, this is the stuff just sort of setting it up in terms of what the different types of loads are. Load combinations, ooh, analytical model settings. <laughs> I'm looking for something over there which actually talks about the member supports and you know, it's, oh, what is it? It's uh, you know, whether we can see something visually. I bet it's sort of buried alive in there. But let me pop back to load combinations. In load combinations, this is where we can define together different load combinations that sort of make sense. So for example, there's a real common one like LFRD. Okay, and that is, you're gonna help me, it's at 1.2 times the dead load plus 1.6 times the live load. Ooh, I got that right. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and put in something. We're gonna say add a case. It's going to be LFRD. What does that stand for? <laughs> does anyone remember? What's that? OK. So 1.2 times the dead load plus, is it 1.6 times the live load? Yeah. Got it there. So I can add it in there. And really, what are we doing here? This is just setting up load cases that ultimately are going to get transferred into ETABs. So you can set them up here. You can set those formulas up in ETABs, whatever you want. It's really just, this just gives you, it'll create a load case that you can switch between in a menu. So the idea is you create as many different load cases as, as you need for the different criteria you're checking against. And there's, yeah, with the new code, there's easily 8 to 10 or 12 of them. There's all these different load cases you have to sort of check to figure out really which one's going to ultimately be bounding and driving your design. So I'll just set up the LFRD one for now. And then to make this easy, I got a couple point loads over there. Let me go ahead. I'm going to put a little load on this part over here, too. We'll say uh, I'll put a load over here. I'm going to host it on that. I'll just make it a, live a line load. And maybe, oh, I'll put another one over there. Like, hosted's going to put it across the entire length. That's another thing that sort of hosted does. Let me put another load in here. 
I'll just do a line load for a piece of it. And I will just draw it from here to here. And I'll make that one be instead like a, a live load. So this is going to go into my uh, live load category. And it'll be 500 or something like that. So I have different load cases I've assigned to these things. But that's the idea is you sort of put the loads on it in here if you want to. And it'll just transfer it into eTabs. And we are pretty much good to go now. So we have structure. We have it connected together. We hopefully have some boundary conditions and some loads on it. We're ready to take it over for some analysis. One thing you may want to do is just check the supports. That sort of tells me that that one seems to be a little problematic as far as it's concerned right now. Let's see if I can figure out why. The error message, I think, actually popped up outside there. Let me try putting another that boundary condition back in there again. I don't think it liked it. Let's try again. Zoom out. I like it to think everything's cool before I go. OK, that time nothing, so I think it's actually good that time. You could also run consistency checks, which again, it's just checking to see if it's internally consistent as far as it's concerned. OK, if you have this, let me go ahead and save this away. I will save this. No, I think I just saved it. OK, well, saved it back on top of uh, step one complete. Okay, and we are now ready to do some transferring. Here's how you transfer. 